And now, from Hollywood, and the winners are Hollywood's biggest stars speaking out over the years about Hollywood. David Sheehan, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Greatly appreciate it. Before we get into where we, you are right now with the 50 years, uh, you started some time back, quite a long time back, and I wanted to, before television, no. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> no, first of all, I greatly appreciate you having us here. Beautiful place here that you have. And then told me you had a great face for radio, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, he was kidding. You got I the hope. voice. Yeah. Well, you started on radio. Well, no, I started in print. David. So, going back to the 1960s, UPI, you started with UPI, and you were focused on Frank uh, Sinatra, the Rat Pack. Well, no, I wasn't really focused. I was a stringer. You know, UPI, a lot of people don't even know what UPI is. It's called, it stands for United Press International. It was the biggest worldwide news service of its day back in the 60s. And uh, for a, a, somebody who's like an aspiring journalist, which is what I was, am, and <laughs> still are. Someday I'll maybe make it. <laughs> uh, but. I was a journalism major at the University of Notre Dame at Ohio State and at UCLA, and I wanted to be a reporter when I grew up. And uh, by golly, I got a chance to do that. And my biggest opportunity was was to work for a UPI, but I, they wouldn't hire me. I was too young, and I had a crew cut, and I looked goofy, but that didn't matter because it was newspaper, not television. Yeah. But they didn't like the way I looked, I guess, when I went in the newsroom. And, Who's this guy? Who's this kid? Get the kid out of here. Hey, you. <laughs> You, the surfer boy, get out of here, man. We're we're working. I said, I'm here to apply for a job. Right. And they said, oh, okay, let's see your writing. Oh, pretty good. They said, pretty good. Okay, you want to be a stringer? I said, okay, I'll take anything. A stringer means you got a random assignments per diem here and there. They'll send you right. some stupid fire or something. Who knows what they'll send you to. But at the same time, I had a, a little newspaper column gig going on in the Santa Monica Evening Outlook. And the Beverly Hills Courier and some of the what they called suburban papers, which were a major uh, source of uh, of news information and advertising in, in during the '60s. And and what got me the the UPI boost up was that uh, what, one day I was one of the restaurants I would cover I was doing the night what they called nightlife news was called Puccini in West Los Angeles from near the corner of Beverly Glen. And one day I was in there, and, and, uh, and Frank Sinatra had a big fight with the parking lot attendant. And that got in the papers, and, they, and everybody was saying, Frank Sinatra is a real arrogant mother, blah, 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 right? And I said, wait a minute. I went and interviewed the parking lot guy. Mm -hmm. And then I put that in the paper, my interview with the parking lot guy, and the parking lot guy said, it wasn't his fault. I, it was my fault. I dinged, I dinged the thing, and I didn't do this, and I didn't do that right. And no wonder he got mad. And I wrote all this up. And so, and I didn't know Sinatra, I was just a little kid reporter. And I got a call from Peter Lawford. Uh, really? Yeah, and he wow. said, uh, uh, we want to uh, thank you very much for the, the little column you wrote there about the, the incident at Puccini, the restaurant parking lot. And I said, oh, well, that, I just try to get the truth. He said, well, uh, we'd like to invite you down here for lunch. So I went down to his, the Peter Lawford estate on the Pacific Coast Highway in, in uh, Santa Monica on the beach, and uh, I had lunch. And who was at the lunch? Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Marilyn Monroe. No. At the, and I'm this little kid, they, uh, I'm from Ohio, right? I was born in Ohio, and I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. And I, my God, I'm sitting here with Marilyn Monroe. Woo she doesn't have any underwear on. Wow, man, <laughs> this is hot stuff. And so, I, anyway, I became kind of friendly. And I would, they would give me little tips and tidbits for my column. Right. And then, of course, I told UPI about that. Wait a minute. <clears throat> I think I'm becoming more than a stringer because I got the inside track. And what were they doing then? They were about to launch the uh, West Coast uh, Kennedy campaign. Okay. So they brought me down for another lunch, and who was there but Jack Kennedy. Wow. Who was playing around with Marilyn Monroe, by the way. This is a true story. I saw it with by my eyewitness, and I'm old enough now that I can... I don't care. It's the truth, though. And uh, and, I, and I got buddy-buddy with Kennedy a little bit, you know, for an hour and a half. Yeah. And then he, he said, you want to go for a swim? I said, sure. So we all, him and me and, uh, and uh, who was it, that guy on the, uh, the Dean Martin show, uh, Rowan and Martin, those guys. Oh, okay. They, they, yeah. We all went in the surf in Santa Monica. Wow. And so I guess, you know, so that's cool. And then... Uh, 
I said, you know, it'd be great for me in my career as a uh, journalist if uh, I could somehow tag along and get a, some kind of press pass for the uh, gala conference, uh, concerts you're going to do in, in, in following the uh, Kennedy campaign in the, in the uh, western part of the United States. And right. They said, well, sure. You're, you're going to be our mascot. You're cute. Let's go. And I was kind of cute. That's a long time ago. I may not be cute anymore, but I was. And they and so I got to go all over the these big stadium concerts where they would have gala, um, vote getting, fundraising. You everything. sing in high hopes, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. You wrote the song from. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah I should have. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, who wrote that song? Anyway, that that was my big break. Yeah. Because I was able to do interviews with Jack Kennedy yeah. and with Sinatra and with Lawford and, and with Sammy Davis and the whole Rat Pack idea and uh, I was doing interviews about politics. Yeah. Why should the guy like Kennedy, he's too young to be president, first of all, and this whole thing about PT-109 I hear is a lot of BS, so I don't know about that. And, 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 and the, those guys who knew everything Oh no, PT one oh nine really haven't, but it's been distorted, and he's a, he's the man. He he will be president. You can count on that because he's got the the charisma. I said, aha, that's for true. That's the truth. And I did a whole story about uh, Kennedy's charisma, as seen by the men who really have charisma: Sinatra, Lawford, uh, Dean Martin, Demi Davis, and Joy Bishop. Yeah, the, these guys exude charisma and they're talking about Kennedy having more charisma than they do and you know what they're probably right and of course he won the election and went on to become the president of the United States but the kicker was they said would you like to come and cover the inauguration I said, I said well sure because the whole rat pack is going to be second third row right. right right there in front of the whole damn thing right and I said sure it's okay it's a hard to get ticket a ticket in front row center of the inauguration of Jack F. J John F. Kennedy, right, right. right? And I said, okay, so you want to bring somebody? I said, yeah. Uh, I was split for my wife at the time, and I said, can I bring my dad? So my dad, who was a factory worker in Columbus, Ohio, I called him, I said, hey, Dad, you want to go to the inauguration? He said, David, you are a crazy man. I always love your craziness, but this is going too far. They're, what are you talking about? I said, no, no kidding, I got tickets. And I got tickets to the inaugural ball. We can do anything we want. Yeah, he, he couldn't believe it. Anyway, he, wow. my, my little daddy and me yeah. sat in, in, sit in the third row, and Jack Kennedy's right there. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And we were right there that very day. And my dad was thrilled to death, and then he died. <laughs> but we all do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was really. But he yeah. saw his son. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about the highest of the highest levels that you can get. <laughs> right. in not just entertainment, but now politics. Yeah, yeah. That it must was, have been uh, quite rewarding for both of you. I yeah, mean, that's incredible. It, yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely a kick. And, it was, and I learned so much. And, and then in UP, I said, thought I was really hot stuff. But yeah. Man, yeah. Whoa. So I was no longer a stringer. I was now a, a bona fide reporter. Uh, for right. UPI, and, I, and they let me keep my little column in, in Santa Monica, West LA, Westwood, Beverly Hills, where I sold restaurant ads. And you did most of that through the 60s? All through the 60s, yeah, yeah. 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 And then in, the, in the late 60s, I started writing reviews, uh, ser more serious reviews of theater uh -huh. and, and things like that. And, and I also worked for the LA Free Press, which was a big deal at that time. And uh, a little bit bigger, bigger circulation, you know, a little more prominence than the yeah. evening outlook. But, um, and I got interested in live theater. In those days, there was a lot of off-Broadway caliber live theater in Los Angeles. They called it the West Coast Off-Broadway. Mm -hmm. Come and see this, and this, and all the, the hottest playwrights, you know, Edward Albee and uh, uh, Pinter and UNESCO and everybody, they, they, they were, their, their plays were being done here either in conjunction with or after a, uh, a pre-run trial in, uh, in New York. Right. And so one day I went to review a play called The Zoo Story by Edward Albee and uh, a Pulitzer Prize winner and everything. And I sat there at my review, at the end of my review said, I hate to say this, but I could have done better. And somebody called me up and got mad at me for saying that. Oh, yeah, if you think you can do better, why don't you go do better? Let me see you. And I said, okay. So I took that as a kind of a challenge and I opened my own theater company in uh, on Pico Boulevard. It's still there. It's, it's now called the Pico Playhouse. Right, and, right. And I started, and so the, the, the show How Good Fortune Keeps Happening, 
uh, Sinatra and all you guys, they came to my opening of, of the Zoo Story, which was Zoo Story, American Dream, and, and Sandbox. So it was a three one act uh, production. And uh, the weekend, and, and, and I remember being on Pico Boulevard, standing on a ladder, putting up the A, L, B, E, E, Albi. And then I said, oh, I know, we're going to call it the Albi Almanac, Zoo Story, American Dream, Sandbox. And I got down off the ladder, and then I went to bed, and then I got woke up in the morning, and Albi wins the Pulitzer Prize that day for Virginia Woolf, for who's a friend yes. of Virginia Woolf. And so the name Edward Albee was suddenly had major reverb. So to make a long story short, we sold out then that run and then that theater thing became uh, very hot. And, th and that's really um, what got me into television because yeah. um, I, I got so hot in the theater operations that I had a theater here that I expanded and had one in San Francisco at the old committee theater on, uh, on uh, Grant. And um, <laughs> so we were doing the White House murder case down here, Jules Pfeiffer. Yeah. And we were doing little murders, Jules Pfeiffer, up there and back and forth, and it was great. But the problem I had was I couldn't get any coverage on television. The print people loved my operation. They did many, many articles. Dan Sullivan, the LA Times guy at the time, just went on and on about this little company is better than anything I've ever seen in New York. And then off Broadway, he's like, wow, it's really got that. But I said, I couldn't get any. And I, so one day I got really, really kind of frustrated and I just called the goddamn desk at, at uh, one of, uh, CBS. And I, and I, and I pretended something. Uh, I represent Edward Albee, which I did. Right. But it was a little fudging. And I want to talk to the manager of the, of the whole operation there. Who, who assigns things? Uh, what, what do you, well, that's called the assignment editor. You want to speak to the assignment editor. I didn't know. Yeah. Okay, hook me up. So I hooked, he got hooked up. Hi, David Sheehan here. Uh, I have this thing. And I can't, I don't understand why I can't get your camera crew. I'm having Edward Albee sitting on the apron of my stage after he just won the Pulitzer Prize, for heaven's sakes. He's about to be giving a big tribute at UCLA right down the street, and you won't send a camera crew for news? You don't think that, well, yes, it is kind of, sounds kind of newsy, but we don't have anybody covering that beat. I said, that beat? That's an old newspaper term. You have beats in TV news too? We sure do, it's just the same thing. Oh, I said, okay. Anyway, then I said, that's interesting, they have nobody covering that. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I think I'll propose that they do. And I think I'll propose me to do it. <laughs> and so I proposed it, 1969, and 1970 I was on the air at CBS. Yeah. yeah. All three stations. I, I just, these were back in the, this was before email, before computers, before, there were no cell phones in those days. Right. You, you, I put, put together a presentation package of, of many typewritten pages, put it in a manila envelope with, with kind of my fancy calligraphy on it, <laughs> and I sent it to yeah. The, yeah. the news director at each of the three stations here in Los Angeles, the all three called me in for interviews. Maybe, maybe, maybe. And I chose CBS because they seemed like they'd be willing to teach me because I knew nothing. Yeah. Uh, video, yeah. there was no video then, it was all film. 60 millimeter newsreel film. And so uh, that's how I started. So Hollywood, Los Angeles, the epicenter of everything entertainment. And you're right at the top. I mean, oh, I well, well, no, <laughs> but I'm talking, I mean, CBS, you're a major network, you're the, the, the local television station here, it's a major city, second biggest market in the United States, right. and now you are tasked to do what, go out and interview the biggest stars, or is that something that you, you made happen? I mean, because everybody knows you as far as having the best stars, the most pivotal power players in Hollywood. Well, How that's did the you, day, yes. and, and that's the new show that we're doing called And the Winners Are 2018. You're going to see uh, 40 of the biggest stars ever. Well, you, you're going to see you're going to yeah. see them going back to the 70s, though. But it was, at the beginning, they didn't know me. Right. So how did that occur? And they and they didn't have any, uh, you know, a comfortability toward doing news yeah. interviews. What? What? They, it wasn't they, a thing. No, it hadn't started yet. And I, I sort of started it. I was the first entertainment reporter on a regular newscast in the history of television. Yeah, yeah. There's a little thing for you. And uh, but it was at the beginning. It was like I, I proposed this this, this package, and, the, and and CBS said they would allow me to be the producer as well as the talent on air. And um, I said, "What does that mean?" Because I didn't know what the words meant. Producer. I mean, I kind of knew, but right, I didn't right, really. Right, right, right. In a TV news. Operation. What does the producer do? 
Well, you have to package it. You have to do the teleprompter. You have to do the time in and time out. We have to know what it is you're going to do and where we're going to put it in the news. We have to have a certain time to the second and another time in and a time out. And I said, oh, I don't understand any of that. I think maybe I, I should just be the talent or just the producer. I can't do both. Yes, you can. Shut up. Oh, okay. I will. And they, they, but you have to do a screen test. So I had to get all cleaned up. You know, yeah, I, yeah. Shaved, I shaved in those days <laughs> and do a screen test yeah. at CBS on a, early on a Saturday morning. And I wasn't used to being up early because I, I covered the nightlife. That was my job for years, right, in the right. newspaper biz. So I had to get up early and do a screen test, but evidently I passed it and got the job. But the uh, at the beginning of it, I was just, my, my package proposal for the segment on the news was movie reviews. That no one ever heard of doing that on TV news. So I would sit there and, and, and review movie after movie after movie. Uh, but at the beginning, they weren't sure this was going to work. There was a lot of opposition mm -hmm. in the newsroom. Mm -hmm. What is this thing you call you? How Why you hire this guy? Jesus, that, this is not news. It's fluffy duffy doo da da ba ba ba. What? There's a lot of opposition. Can I get a, somebody to help me edit this movie clip I got from the studio? No, we can't help you. We're doing news, man. I don't know what the hell you're doing, but mm -hmm. we're doing news. I said, well, I have a job here, sir, and uh, I'm supposed to do two and a half minutes on the six o'clock twos. Sure. I need your help. Okay, we'll help you. So eventually they came around and, you know, and helped me learn how to do it. <clears throat> but in, the, in those days, it was just the beginning. It was just, just pure reviews. You created a genre. <laughs> Yeah, right. I mean, there's no Cisco in I have a genre. Right? Yeah, no, but, there's nothing. I mean, uh, you, yeah. and so the the goal for you was to do what with that? Was it to was it to interview the stars, or was it, was it just to transfer you know, your opinions on movies that you were seeing? I mean, did you see a career for you? Because there was no industry doing movie reviews on television at the time. No, I never, I don't think I ever thought of it in, in terms of a word like career. Right. I just was... I wanted to write, and I always wanted to write, so I, I went to newspapers, and I had a lot of fun doing that, and I'm, I got good at it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and uh, I probably, if there was any thought of a career, it was probably more, uh, I want to be a really front-page, byline newspaper man when I grow up, you know? Yeah. But this other, this, this TV thing was just an idea, and it was the idea was only because I couldn't get coverage for my theater company on TV, and then when I found out the reason was they had nobody doing that, I thought, well, I'll, let me do it, man. It was a good idea. <laughs> so you've, you've created this genre. You're looking at it from the standpoint of, wow, you know, I found a need and I'm filling it. Yeah. Yeah. Right? There was a hunger for that, which is amazing to me in a city like Los Angeles that that didn't exist to begin with. Movies aren't brand new in the 1970s. They've been going for 40 <laughs> right. years at that point. Right. Right? You would think. But the news people... The people who run the newsrooms and the news departments at uh, major, what they call own and owned and operated stations, big stations and big markets owned by the network, they had a real hard nose. Hard, they call it hard news. They wanted to cover hard news. Anything fluffy. They, you, the weatherman had a hard time getting more than, than, than maybe 45 seconds in, the, in those days. The weather only was 45 seconds long. Cause they, yeah, yeah. They, they went hard news. Sports was cut down to, 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 to two minutes, two minutes, ten seconds for the sports report because they wanted it to be hard news. That's what they were all about. And, and there was FCC doctrines and all kinds of things going on. They had a lot of excuses. Uh, and so when I first was entered into it, they said, we don't think this is going to work. Yeah. But the guy who, owns the, who runs the station, the general manager, he does think you're going to work. And he hired you, so we have to go along with it. But we can tell you right now, uh, you know, keep your other job if you got one, or look for another one on the side, because this will never, it might not work. This will never last in, in so, the world of news. And so when I started, they I said, "What's the deal?" Yeah. They said, "Well, the deal is about seventy-five thousand dollars a year." I said, yeah. Okay, that was a lot of money in right. nineteen seventy. Yeah. But it wasn't a fortune. And he said, and the, but they said, but the good, thing, the good news is we're only going to run you on on the weekends. We don't know if this is going to work or not, so we're not going to put you money through Friday, because you're a whole new thing, and, and we don't know if you know what you're doing, and we don't know if the viewer is going to be uh, receptive to it. And so, I did the Saturday and Sunday newscast, yeah, but yeah. not during the week. But they got such feedback from the weekend audience. That right away, the general manager, the news, the programming director, the advertising director, who really made a lot of the decisions, 
So that thing you're doing on a weekend, that, the people want to buy commercials in that little segment. Well, you can't buy just that segment. Well, they want to buy a commercial in the news that is adjacent to that segment. And this went on and on and on for, you know, it was maybe six months. And they finally said, well, you know, if, if, if it's a hot thing on the weekend news, mm -hmm. we should put it on all every night. So, oh, so, Mr. Sheen, would you come in the office? <laughs> I, 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 I want to get into this a little bit deeper, but maybe you could touch upon it right now because I was, I was hoping we could discuss this further in the interview here. We've seen a huge shift in news, right? News were hard news, Cronkite, you know, and, and, and you just, you know, just the facts. And basically today we're entertained to death in, in a much of the news, right? Right. It, was that the beginning of the shift, do you think? Was I the beginning? <laughs> I mean, well, were you the be or was that mindset of, you know what? This is getting ratings. We're, we're, we're now selling more advertising. Yeah. Maybe we need to put this in Monday was, through Friday. That was always the key. If you suddenly find Because news knows never about money before that, right? Yeah, it's always, it, it, news divisions generally show didn't make, me the money. Yeah, but news divisions didn't make profits, generally speaking, did they? Now there are huge divisions within right. these networks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It, uh, it, it certainly made him uh, pay attention. And it was, I think, uh, the they, they did a lot of different things. They did these uh, galvanic skin test uh, audience previews in a, in a theater where they were bringing people off the street to watch a newscast. Uh -huh. and, the, and, the, and by their hookup to the galvanic skin test, they could tell when the person is, oh, I like that. Or what a person is going to do. And so I scored. It was like a biometric thing? Or? Yeah. It was, wow. This was way back. So it was pretty yeah. primitive. But I scored yeah. through the roof. For some reason, people liked me because I was kind of a smart-ass kid. And I was telling Hollywood that <laughs> the, they're full of baloney. And, and, some, some of them, and I began right away with an anti-screen violence crusade. And, so, and a lot of the people, they responded to that. Yeah, there's too much violence in the movies. It's bad for us to be watching all that stuff. Right. The beheading, the mutilation, the, the explosions. But he, he likes, the, and I always liked the, the more, you know, humane movies. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but all those things contributed to, uh, it, it, was a, it was just luck, really. I was, I was, it wasn't that I was that good, because I really wasn't very good at the beginning, and for sure. I can show you tapes. The guy doesn't know what he's doing. But, but there was something about it between my um, naivete, I guess. Mm -hmm. I was a little naive, still am. And the idea of, uh, there's a guy on the news, you know, honey, did you see? He reviewed that movie we were going to go see tomorrow night. And he says it's terrible. He says the actors, the actors don't know how to act, and, and it's too mean and mean-spirited. And I don't know if I'm going to go. So it became a thing in the households. Yeah. Oh, yeah. let's watch Channel 2, because they got that guy on there who does movie reviews. Yeah. You know, it was like a ho unheard of in the in the time. I was I was a kid fresh off the boat from England in the late seventies, and I remember you, and I enjoyed it. It was it was I the entertaining it was the entertaining part of news for me. People come at me a lot right? of times. I've been watching you since I was a little boy. Yeah. Said, well, let's see, that makes me pretty old, but yeah. <laughs> it's kind of cute. No, I appreciate that. I I do definitely appreciate the acknowledgement. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it was that kind of thing. And so people, and then, and then of course the other stations started imitating, and pretty soon everybody had a, a, movie, right, right. a movie reviewer because one person followed the other. But nineteen um, seventies, we saw a, a, a big um, push towards blockbusters. I, I, you always had big movies, you know, in the fifties and the sixties, but the seventies, whether it was the Spielbergs or you know, you had the Star Wars uh, in nineteen seventy seven and so yeah. on. What what changes did you see just in those few years alone? I mean, eighties and nineties is altogether different, but. I mean, did you see the industry changing, and, and, and how is the reporting on that changing as well? Well, the reporting changed by everybody developing these half-hour shows like Entertainment Tonight and Access Hollywood and Extra and all those yeah. things. They turned the whole, they turned what I started out as a minute and a half, two minutes on the news. It became an industry. They turned it into a half-hour shows that are nationally syndicated. But as far as the, uh, the content, uh, during during my happiest years, it was about things were about something. You know, network, for example, with Peter Finch. Yes. Uh, or the candidate with Robert Redford, or um, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Oh, yep. They were about something that had pertinence to the human experience. And then that became kind of taken over by blockbusters and action heroes and Arnold Schwarzenegger and all that kind of stuff. So that uh, the switch is as. Uh, 
even all the way into the all through the 80s and 90s, it got it got a little gradually worse. You know, it was still the 90s were still pretty good. I remember having a lot of good times in the 90s. Yeah. But by the time we got to the 2000s, man, I found myself doing. You know, I'm on the air five nights a week, and I'm giving four bad reviews out of five. This tells me something about either my taste or what Hollywood is up to. Yeah, and it used yeah. to be the reverse. I used to love everything because they they delivered their lines properly and, and the sh camera never shook and everything was cool. And I would and the story was very involving and I loved everything I saw. So I was doing maybe three or four rave reviews out of five. Right. And suddenly by the 2000s, that reversed. And so you, you really enjoyed the human condition on the screen. Yeah. The Kramer versus Kramer yeah. and, and whatever it may be, Cuckoo's yeah. Nest and so on. Um, you know, we had Nick Searcy on uh, on the show recently and he's in he was in two Oscar nominated movies, three billboards of uh, and uh, Shape of Water. Oh yeah. And he said the the problem with Hollywood today, and it's been this way for some time, is that they do two types of movies. They do Oscar Bait uh -huh. or they do tentpole movies, the yeah. Marvel comics. Right, right. All the stuff in between is getting lost now. There not, aren't many of them anymore. Uh, what did I see? I saw uh, The Big Sick, which was in it running for Oscars for a while because it's so well done. Uh -huh. But it's just a pure movie about life and love and uh, sex and loyalty and fidelity and, and confusion. and things. It was a very sweet, sweet movie. Or the movie like in, in, in the show that uh, I'm hoping you're, you're going to promote, uh, And the Winners Are, yes. 2018. <laughs> plug, plug, uh, on YouTube, uh, anywhere you go, it, one of my big statements in, in my new show is that uh, Shape of Water? Yeah. Gary Oldman? Well, let's, let's jump to 2018 real quick. You thought The Post should have won. And I said... It, the, it, I nominated. The Post right? at least got nominated, but not much. Right. It, the, the, it got nominated for Best Picture, but Spielberg got nothing for director, and Hanks was not nominated at all, Tom Hanks. Yeah. And Meryl Streep was, though, for playing the publisher. But um, th that, that movie was an example of, of the good kind of movies I remember from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. It's like, uh, you know, the, the um, All the President's Men. Yeah. Thing. It had a little historical element to it, and it, it, had, it, it kind of took you somewhere that you didn't really know because you haven't been there behind the scenes in a newspaper behind yeah. the scenes and so and all that kind of stuff but it had an also a heart and soul drama to it and uh, I just thought the post was wonderful the, the way it uh, defined and described the Pentagon Papers mm -hmm. and and all of the, that whole issue at the time about the, the way the government lied about Vietnam mm -hmm. and uh, the movie I thought was wonderfully done and put together and, and it, it was educational at the same time and um, it got ignored <laughs> but uh, in favor it, it, of these... Uh, and it didn't get much of an audience, if I understand correctly. No, it didn't do too well. Right, it didn't do too well. So, so going back to the 70s and where you had these big pictures and you were writing about the pictures and you were interviewing the folks of all the president's men, Dustin Hoffman, Robert Redford. Uh, first of all, what would you say, going back, and I don't want you to um, alienate anybody, but what, who were some of your favorite <laughs> interviewees? Oh. Of that period, because we're talking the golden age here now. Yeah. Oh, well, the, my favorites are always my favorites. You know, Tom Hanks, Marlon Brando, yeah, Barbara Streisand, Julia Roberts. Uh, they are always to the journalist on the other end of the interviewing table. Right. You know, the, the what makes it a favorite is somebody who's who's really happy to be there. Yeah. Because a lot of them are just there because the contract says I have to be, and yeah. you can just feel that. You know, you know, yeah. What? What? What'd you say? What was the question again? Uh, Just doing know, another junket. You, yeah, yeah. The, the Tommy Lee Jones is like the worst offender in that respect. Yeah. yeah. Uh, doing an interview with him is like pulling teeth, you know. But Tom Hanks, whoa, he's right there. What do you want to do, David? Hey, what, yeah. what kind of a, what kind of a story? You, you, what's your angle on this? What, what do you want me to talk about? Because I could go here, there, there, and but I'm, I'm glad I want to be in sync with you. What? What? He asked me, what, what do I want? And then I just fire. He's very cooperative. Did that ever color your your perception of a movie? Sure. So if you really like Tom Hanks, yeah. you really like a Tom Hanks movie. Yeah. You you, you get prejudiced to some you extent, do. and then you have to really be strong. Uh, it, you, it always took place in the car, 
because I would go to see Tom Hanks it, and he did some silly thing I didn't like. I forgot what it was, but some Dragnet takeoff or some stupid movie. Yeah, Dan Aykroyd. Yeah, really. Yeah, that like was it. awful. Yeah, <laughs> but I love Tom Hanks. <laughs> right. And he's always been so good to me. He even went and got me coffee for heaven's sake during the interview. Wait a minute, she needs a coffee. Or, or he used to love it because I smoked and he smoked. Yeah. A lot of the guys, whenever I came in, there, here comes she and smoke break. And our cameraman, everybody took a break and we went out in the balcony of the hotel yeah, or whatever yeah. it was and smoked. But so uh, you see a movie like that, um, what was the name of it? Dragnet. Dragnet. Uh, yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm sitting there and I get in the car in the parking lot and I got to go back to the station and write a review and cut the clips and cut, and cut my voice over and there. I got to. Uh, I'm in a hurry now because I have to be on at 11 o'clock, right? And the movie just ended at, at 5 after 9. And woo! And I'm in wherever the movie screening was, usually on the lot at Paramount or someplace. But I was always pressed. Right. And I'm thinking, and thinking but I love Tom Hanks. He's always so nice to me. How can I, what can I, oh my goodness. And I had to have a lot of uh, mm, internal struggle. And I said, well, I think probably he would, he would respect my honesty. And I think I probably he would respect it even more if I was really honest and really said how bad it is. <laughs> and then maybe he'll learn from that. It could be a compliment. It could be, uh, you know, the kind of things that we all learn from when somebody really hits us in between the eyes. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, uh, yeah. and that's what I would do. Then I would, I would go back and I would not allow that uh, friendship to uh, alter my opinion. And what was his response to you after he saw a bad review? A couple of times he didn't like it. But most of the time he said, thank you for saying that because it's the truth and I knew it and I, I was hoping nobody he else... knew it. I know, I was hoping nobody right. else would notice, but you did, she and you shit. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but okay. But sometimes, you know, uh, he, he the, what was it, Bosom Buddies or something? Yeah, the, the sitcom in the 70s. Uh, or the one where he danced... Uh, Bachelor Party. No, the one where he danced on the keyboard with his feet. Oh, big. Big, yeah. Yeah, I, I Robert Loja. I, w I wasn't yeah. so excited about that, but it was kind of cute. And I said, you know, what's Tom Hanks doing this silly stuff for? It's a kid's movie. Yeah. And he did not like that. He, he said, Sheehan, you, you, you're getting too much into yourself. Who do you think you are anyway? You're so self-absorbed. This is a movie we made for the, the mass audience. Right. That includes children, but there's a child in all of us. You're, you're getting to be a little bit too strident. And he went like that. Strident. I said, oh my God, Tom, I never saw this side of you. Well, wait till you see Saving Private Ryan. You'll see a lot of sides of me. I said, oh, are you pissed at me now? He said, yes. Quite frankly, I am because <laughs> I, I, I think you were unfair. You were, you were really unfair. I said, would you like to come on the air and say that? And that's how... I think it was the Tom Hanks. That's how the whole idea of interviewing movie stars began. I didn't ever think I was going to be doing interviews. I never thought of it. Okay. I was re doing reviews. And I, I'm pretty sure it was Tom who got mad at me about a review. And I said, well, if you're that mad and you think I'm that off base and unfair, let me be fair. Come on the news and say what you want to say. He said, what? Nobody heard, heard of that before. And it started out where I actually brought... Him and Charles Bronson, because I hated Death Wish. Oh, that was one of the worst movies you ever. You hated Death hated Wish? hated it. It was vigilante violence. It was the You know, Bruce Willis is doing a remake. I know. I heard that. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. But it's, it's appeals to the lynch the mob mentality. That, you know, there's no, it's, it's almost like what's yeah. going on but now. But you had spoken out about violence all throughout the 70s. Anyway, right. you felt that was. But, but some stories, like even Shakespeare had some violence in it. So sure. some stories, the violence is justified. But in this case, the violence is not only uh, glorified, it, it's presented as the solution to problems. Yeah. And then it appeals to this lynch mob mentality without any due process of law or any, any kind of uh, a day in court or anything. Right. Kill him, kill him, kill him, beat him up. Right. So I hated that stuff. But uh, anyway, it started with me uh, physically um, having to figure out Parking like we did today, parking yeah, spaces. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're in kind because of, you want to do this. Yeah, this is very unusual. You really mean this? I said, yeah. You have the power to invite me in. I said, well, no, but I had to get approval. But I'm sure nobody would say, no, you can't have Tom Hanks come and sit on the anchor's desk. I said, I don't think anybody's going to say that. Even Charles Bronson. Didn't, so, but I did have to get clearance when I went to the news director. I said, I have this idea. I want to bring in somebody to do a counter review. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You what? You go, uh, on the anchor desk? So it started out on the anchor desk. I think only two or three times, and then it became, hey, why don't you go interview this guy and this guy? And, then, and it became, then we would they would give me a camera crew mm -hmm. and a truck and everything. We would go 
to people's homes or to the set of a movie being shot. This was all before the days of the junkets. Nowadays, everything is done in a hotel room yeah, and it's yeah. all pre-organized. But I started all that because there was no, no real uh, presence of, of a reporter doing interviews with movie stars about a movie. Yeah, yeah. If they got in an accident or they were sued or they had been some big divorce or something like that, they might get on the air as an interview subject. But I just talked to him about movies. Yeah. Like, Why do you like this movie? Why do you want to make this movie? So whatever. And then so that became a thing. It's interesting. Um, you, you just talk about Charlie Bronson. Uh, the 80s, you had this, this period where we had all these macho men. You actually did a program on it. The macho men of the 80s. You had Rambo and Rocky and Schwarzenegger and all of those guys. And Clint. Right? And Clint Eastwood. Yeah. They're one of my favorites all time. Yeah. Um, uh, did you feel that that was uh, uh, that you were answering the call about violence and trying to make? I don't know. What was your perspective on it from the standpoint of was it comic book? Was it to try and make it uh, more palatable? What were we? What was your perspective on all of those? Like Rambo was just to shoot him up, right? Mm -hmm. Clint Eastwood was shoot him up many cases as yeah. well, and it was something you were uncomfortable with. No, and uh, remember Don Olmeyer was the uh, NBC, NBC head man. Yeah. Uh, first, he was the head of NBC Sports, kind of a famous guy in the business, Don Olmeyer, O H L M E. He, yes. did, he died just recently. Yeah, I'm sorry to say, but anyway, he was uh, uh, my kind of my my fan. Uh -huh. <laughs> he said, "I watch I watch your thing on that. I, I tape recorded it. In those days, we had little tape recorders. <laughs> the day you can do it on the phone, right? Right. We had bits of lab. You could actually get a little videotape, what they called an air check." You can record off the air in the building. Now, you right. can't do it at home. But he said, I, I got your thing that you did on such and such. And I, I played it back three times. That's, I like your writing, you know, or something. He was giving comments. And then I came and said, uh, you know, I think this is, this, uh, this is an opportunity for us to uh, maybe uh, send a message about all this violence that's going on. But, oh, he said, you can't do that. You can't do it. Because I was trying to sell him on the idea of me doing a network special, not just a local newscast, right? And, and he wanted me to do it, but he, he said uh, my approach was wrong. You can't do a crusading thing. On a, no, it would be a network special. It would have to be somehow hung on, uh, on celebrities, maybe. I said, okay, I think I know how to do that. I, th I think we can uh, uh, meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, meet him with uh, because you could, it's reasonable to say and you know give over some um, degree of adulation these guys are big stars and they went from being an actor out of work and now they're Clint Eastwood and Sylvester Stallone his whole story about Rocky and, I, and, and, uh, and Arnold an immigrant coming from nowhere so mm -hmm. we, we can go in that door and then we can do a little stuff about all oh, this violence what are they mm -hmm. doing to him? Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. I, so I brought on in that show, our, 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 what's his name, Arthur Janoff, the uh, psychiatrist who fostered that thing called the Primal Scream. Okay. And um, oh God, who else? Abraham Maslow from Brandeis University. I brought in some talking heads to comment on the wow. effect on the effect on the human psyche, the human nervous system of being sitting through two hours of this amplified. Sense around sound, you know, and what do you think that does to us? And there was a lot of different opinions, so I got that element into it too. But at the same time, we were—I was, you know, interviewing Sylvester Stallone. And right? How, how did you get? What, well, why did why did you not let them make Rocky? You, you said you had to be there. Yeah, uh, that's in the show, as a matter of <laughs> yeah, fact. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of that stuff. Yeah, the same and, with Clint. When I first interviewed yeah. him, I. I I brought him into the the whole idea of uh, boy, you really are a superstar, man. Yeah. Woo, boy, oh boy, and, and, and you went from the westerns, and now you're the hero of all heroes with Dirty Harry. What is that all about? And, and, and then he said, Yeah, I love it. He was loving himself, and yeah, he, it's great. It's in the show where you see him right there. Whatever year that was, seventy something, yeah. and uh, and he was loving himself. I'm Dirty Harry. People everywhere would probably wish there was a dirty Harry on every corner in case they get molested or something, you know. And I and I'm getting a kick out of uh, taking people on a trip. And then I, little little David, I'm like look like I'm 12. Why do you always have to take him on a violent trip? <laughs> I mean, yeah, but why do you think you're glorifying violence? No, we, we don't bell heads. <laughs> 
And so that's all in the show, and the winners are, yeah. uh, among many, many, many other things. But um, that, that was how, and I, anyway, that was a network special. National, my first one ever. Yeah. NBC Network. That wasn't just local local news. That was a, a pretty big deal at the time. Yeah. And, and that, that was successful, so then they let me do one called Hollywood's Leading Ladies. And then I, did, uh, I was ready to do another one called um, The Oscar Race. I had done one Oscar race show for them, right. a network show, but that was because of Dick Clark. He took a liking to me and put me in the, the Oscar race. That was the heyday of the big box office blockbusters and the stars. Yeah. Who are the stars today? I don't even know. I don't go to movies anymore. I'm retired. No, <laughs> I don't. But the stars today I mean, the is big... still Tom Hanks. And um, I, it's hard to call Gary Oldman a, a star. He's, he's a journeyman actor for sure. But I, I got a sense watching this that you didn't think he should have won for a Churchill. No, it was a masquerade. It wasn't much acting. Tom Hanks was really going in. That, that got rave reviews. I know, and he got an Oscar. Yeah. <laughs> so whatever I know, I'm just a critic. Uh, but but sure. But when you look at the at the tapestry there, Tom Hanks p playing Ben Bradley, the editor of the Washington Post. That's yeah, nothing like yeah, Tom Hanks. Yeah. Where, where it, and it was it was more than acting. It was like he became he became that man. He wanted to release those Pentagon Papers, but there were all kinds of problems about it. You all kinds of opposition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you could feel you no longer thought that's Tom Hanks doing quite a job. Right. You you were right there with Ben Bradley, you know, the editor, doing his job to try to release the papers that's going to expose government lying about Vietnam. You yeah. had. That was my take on it, whereas when I watched Gary Oldman, oh, he's masquerading as Winston Churchill. Nice job. It's a Halloween costume, too. You know, it's one of those things. That yeah, <laughs> I yeah. wasn't that impressed with the acting. And, and Frances McDormand, though, did a nice job in terms of winning. But, but she's in a movie that's horrible it's, uh, in, in the sense that what is it about? Vengeance, meanness. Yeah. There's no uplift in, in it at all. And and, 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 and and that's a great segue to my next question for you because it's interesting because as, at the beginning as we sat down you talked about how you entered into entertainment it was really through politics yeah right, right? I, do you see that how how has politics if you will um, and and Hollywood listen we turn on the night nightly comedian shows today and everything is just anger and and, and a lot less comedy. Do you see that arc changing and and how has that impacted entertainment? Do we see? I mean, do you see a split with 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 the country as far as voting goes. Do you see that in Hollywood? Do you see that in the programming? Yeah, there's there. It's a little bit of a, a schizoid um, kind of a frenetic leaning this way and that way. Most of it, I think, is ethnic, in terms of the entertainment business. Okay. The, 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 there's been a what I called in the show a, a seismic shift. Yeah. The people who were there, there were two years in a row, for example, with the Oscars where there was not one black actor nominated. Not one. And that's for, what the Oscar So White hashtag for, was for. Exactly. It, okay. uh, yeah. And uh, uh, Will Smith, my old buddy, and, yeah. and his wife, uh, Jada Pickett, uh, they, they started that movement. But, but basically that was an indication of where Hollywood's head was at and where the office people who uh, say, okay, we're going to set up an audition for this certain, certain, certain part. We, we want to see 11 people and let, bring them in and we'll read them and have them read a page of the script and blah, blah. And they were all white. The people who got auditions were white. Maybe one token black here and there or somebody ethnically otherwise, you know. But it, w it was just complete for two solid years. Mm -hmm. You could sort of use the Oscars as the indicator when not one person of some other ethnic origin was even part of the game. They were completely eliminated and, and ignored. And, and then their movement came. And so you had all that. And that was both uh, spiritual, political, and racial, right? So you had all the things going on there. And so that... Um, where, where that ends up now in uh, 2018 is hard for me to say. I don't know the, the, what the, we got this Trump guy, and we don't, but who knows? Um, I know my stocks have gone up, and so my portfolio is, right. is better. It depends, but I don't know what's going on in terms of uh, civil rights and uh, civil disobedience. Do you think that's inherent racism within the industry of Hollywood, or is it just that that is what the particular movies and films or television shows are calling for on those particular 
projects. Well, it's probably inherent in America. The, the, we brought mm -hmm. over the slaves and all that stuff, and the, the white people were actually, a, on the bottom line, the men were afraid of the black men. Because and so what do you do? You suppress them, and you keep them down. Okay. And so, because you're afraid of them, really. You're, the, it's all a fear thing, I think. And, uh, and then they eventually will rise up, which they've yeah, done. Yeah. Thank goodness, they, with the help of a lot of, of white guys, too. We all helped them. That, this is not right. It's not fair. Let's, it's not human. The humanity, the humanization of the business uh, is, is better now than it's ever been, I think. Uh, but it's still a struggle. And the Me Too movement. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, it's a tsunami, right? I mean, yeah. most of the Oscars 2018 evolved, revolved around this issue. Uh, but this has been a long time coming, hasn't it? I guess. I don't know. I'm... Um, um, I was just dealing with that, that whole question in terms of whether Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to be, I'll be back in my show or not, because I realized kind of, I'm a little dumb on some portion of my brain, and I, I loved Arnold, and we had buddy buddy, we had a lot of arguments about violence, I hate what you're doing, yeah, yeah. and your body counts are high. He said, what do you do, count me? You'll count David? You'll count the bodies? Are you crazy? And I, and I love the piece, I wanted to put it in the show. And then I realized yeah. that my, first my girlfriend said, you're not putting Arnold Schwarzenegger in there, and it's what he did to his, his housekeeper, and, and, and he was having sex with her in the laundry room, and then they had a baby, and, and Maria and the kids, everybody. I said, wow, I never thought of that. And then I did a little survey of uh, ladies that I know to see what the uh, knee-jerk first Rorschach kind of, did you say the word Arnold Schwarzenegger? And mm -hmm. I think it was the, maybe nine out of 14 who just had the worst reaction. Just, like, just give me one or two words of your feeling. Mm -hmm. And my ex-wife, uh, who I'm very close to, her, her reaction was, this was all in text, right? Her reaction was, bleh, B-L-E-C-C-H-H-H-H, -H -H -H, bleh. And my, my uh, daughter-in-law said, oh, God, disgusting. Mm -hmm. And my other ex-wife said, hey, you're kidding me. Jesus, chauvinistic. And so I said, wow. There's a groundswell yeah. of uh, anti-Arnold um, reaction, which is really part of the, the new awareness that women are, are finally saying, wait a minute, you may, I'm not a sex object, you can't treat me that way, yeah, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, it's, it, but, but on the other hand, you got the, the thing that a lot of men are being ruined uh, w without due process of law. It's a big issue. Which is really, you know, yeah. I don't know who's guilty of who isn't. Uh, how, how would I know? How would anybody he know? Said, she said. Because the allegation, allegation, and you're right. dead. Right. There's, what happened to presumed innocence until proven guilty? Whatever happened to that? That's out the window. Yeah. Yeah. So you got that aspect of it. But on the other hand, it's about time women stood up and said, hey, get your hand off my butt. Yeah. You know, that's, the, yeah. So I'm, I'm definitely on the side of the female. Yeah. But also, I, I'm, I'm kind of uh, empathetic or sympathetic with the poor guys who are getting fired right and left. Not just fired, their whole lives have been ruined. All the projects that they had planned, they had money, they had seed money, they had this, d d destroyed. So do you think the pendulum has swung too far? <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah. I wonder what those guys did. I mean, I said, I wonder what Harvey Weinstein did. Hey, lady, I mean, what, what, the, what were they thinking? Right, right. I mean, I've played around a lot, and, and every man... He has to probably admit that he's made some decisions based on the other in front of his anatomy <laughs> as opposed to his brain, and we've right. all done that. But right. but I guess you can do that in uh, in a, in the spirit of, of uh, at least the loving friendship or something or yeah, fun. Yeah, Let's just yeah. have some fun yeah. uh, as opposed to being uh, hostile about it yeah. or aggressive or arrogant or whatever the word is belligerent. I think maybe some men were. Uh, allowing themselves to be sexually belligerent, and I don't blame the women for being not only turned off by it, but also wait a minute, let boom, let's fire it back. And so th that's a really nice uh, duality of an issue. There, you can't, at least I can't go totally one way or the other. I, I guess if I had to go one way or the other, I'd be on the side of the women. But my heart also sympathizes with all the men who have been completely destroyed without due process of law. It's, it's interesting how it's just kind of seeped into the culture and it's just become such, I mean, you know, uh, it, it, again, the award shows focusing on it and such, it's, it's 
the lexicon of our language right now. Oh, well, speaking of that, the, yes. one of the pieces I'm most proud of in, in the show, and the winners are on YouTube streaming now, uh, plug, plug, is my piece with Barbara Streisand. I was going to ask you wh about Where that. I interviewed her yes. in 1970, interviewed her again in 1980, again in 1990, and again in the She 2000. seems very focused on her physical appearance. Right, but also there was a lot of stuff about, I believe in women. She's saying this yes. way back in 1971, before there was any such thing as a woman's movement. She did. There wasn't even much yes, feminism, and Gloria Steinem was just beginning. And and uh, uh, I, I, I like the, the structure of that piece because it showed her thinking in 1971 yeah. and showed her face changing in 1980, yeah. and then her thinking and her cha change in 1990, and in the 2000s, she's a little different in terms of how she looks, and she is kind of obsessed with her looks, but yeah. her thoughts and and her beliefs and i believe in the best of both worlds mixing all the new i love women i think and i believe in my own truth and she was strong before there yeah. was anybody being strong yeah it was quite impressive there wouldn't that. be there would not yeah. be i would say i don't know who knows but you kind of could say that it probably wouldn't be a, a me too times up hashtag if it hadn't been for people like barbara streisand starting way back in the 1970s to say wait a minute I mean, yeah, I'm equal. In fact, the, re the reason they've been made to think they're not equal is because men are scared, afraid of the fact that they're superior, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. And, and women are, probably. Um, yeah. Especially in terms of it. I don't have the intuition that my girlfriend has. I, I couldn't compare to it. But uh, we have the strength and power, and, and it's a male-dominated society. So we're, we're lucky we're not going to turn our backs on that, I guess, yeah. as long as it doesn't go evil. Last question for you, and we do have links uh, to your YouTube interview uh, with this. Um, we're seeing something changing here, profoundly changing, whereas people are going to the movies less, but some of the best produced entertainment in the world, in the history of television now, is there whether it's Netflix or Amazon or yeah. some of the network stuff, yeah. okay? If you, were, if, 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 if you were coming into the entertainment industry today, starting out as you did uh, 50, 60 years ago, um, you know, how would you wh where would you go to to find the best entertainment? How would you be able to report on all of that when we're so, um, it, it, it's almost so split up. It's almost hard to find the best stuff anymore. Whether it's a Breaking Bad series, or you know something on Amazon. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, because it's more than just the big screen, big movies, big titles. You got movies. one big movie in a week. Everybody goes to see it. Yeah. James Bond or whatever it is. Now there's 50 different things coming out I every know. week. Yeah, how do you hurt. find it? What do how do you report on that today? Um, well, today I don't have to work so hard, so I'm not right. doing in the news every day anymore. I'm just doing these hour long specials, and um, but that's that's a, a good point. And, and like for example. Uh, I wanted to construct a, a piece on Nicole Kidman, <clears throat> who I always admired her acting and, and, and her talent and her the way she got through stuff, like the whole thing with Tom Cruise. Oh, my God, the, the girl, was, her heart was completely shattered. That was back in the 90s? Yeah, and, but yeah. yet she rose to the occasion to do Moulin Rouge, and, and she continued and did, did wonderful, wonderful work. And now here she is in, in one of those things you're talking about, whatever you call them, the streaming Netflix, HBO, yeah. uh, uh, called uh, Big Little Lies. Lies. Yeah. And, and yeah. I never would watch that kind of stuff. I don't, wouldn't even know about it because it's not highly promoted. But because I was doing a story on Nicole, I had to look at it. And that's quite good. It, it's I about, haven't seen it's it. It's about yeah. a woman being a, a battered by her husband but they live so well, and like she says in the interview, uh, or in one of the clips, I, 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 I thought many times about leaving him, but you know, we have, uh, we have so much. They do. They have a lot of things and stuff, and they even have some good aspects of their relationship. But when he gets drunk or pissed or angry, <laughs> and you know, that ain't, that ain't gonna fly. Yeah, so, yeah. She, so but, but I never would have even, um, gone there had it not been for me doing a Nicole Kidman story mostly having to do with movies and Oscars and what she won an Oscar for it yeah. <coughs> and all that kind of thing so um, yeah I know what you're saying but I, I don't know um, if I have any great insight into it just that there's a lot of stuff that's some and great incredible content The Crown for example yeah. which I'm not a big fan of the monarchy some of the best television I've ever seen in my life yeah. hundred million dollars which is a movie budget you can see it all on the big screen on the s small screen yeah as a consumer the, yes. the, 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 it's, it's a banquet it's a bountiful smorgasbord of so many things and um, 
uh, I guess after 50 years of, of going to movies as a job mm -hmm. and getting free popcorn, uh, <laughs> fringe benefits. I can't I can't wait to go on Route 66. You know, <laughs> so it's a, it's and a, you're not promoting it. <laughs> no, just, I love the road. I love the ride. You're all alone. Nobody's there anymore. Right. They right. they vacated Route 66, so you can drive. You can drive down the middle of the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're not gonna hit anybody because nobody's coming. Yeah. <laughs> Very rare. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm not, I'm not as much of a consumer, and then of of entertainment in in any form as I was because I did that for 50 years as a living. That was my job. I had to go to the movies. So you, you don't watch much anymore? Not much. No, okay. I, I mean, I watch the movies to do the show, Yeah. but I don't go to the theater or concerts as much as I used to because I used to have to do it on uh, with, with a camera crew yeah. and it worked. And then I had to run back to the station and type it up really fast and come up with something clever to say and then cut it in and then, and then go to makeup and hair and get, oh, oh here I am. Hi, David Sheen here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so... There was all of that whole element going on, and now I, I just get the biggest kick out of being in the middle of nowhere. Like that's why I like Route 66. Enjoy I just it. got back from a trip, yeah, and, then, yeah. and then you feel close to God, whatever God is, <laughs> some kind of the higher power thing. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's wonderful, but uh, but but if I was a consumer of uh, entertainment or working in it as much as a reporter. Uh, I would probably be, uh, feel overwhelmed because in my day, it was, yeah, you had a, like you said, two or three movies opening on a weekend. Sometimes only one really right. big when you had to pay attention to. And and I did I did a lot of television reviewing too. I was the first one to ever review television on television, and they finally killed that because I kept giving CBS uh, shows bad reviews, like Bill Cosby and so on. <laughs> and they said, I think we're gonna not do this anymore, David. Is that, you, do you mind just sticking with the movies? For <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, I knew that was coming because the advertisers were complaining. Yeah, you're kind of eating your own. You got a guy yeah. standing, sitting on Channel 2 at 11 o'clock telling people not to, or at 6 o'clock telling people not to watch what's yeah. on television that night. What? Are you crazy? And yeah. they said, yeah. mm, maybe we're a little crazy. David, you want to come in the office for a minute, please? <laughs> we got a few things to talk about. And what they wanted to talk about, don't do that anymore. <laughs> don't, do, don't do what anymore? Don't give CBS shows the bad reviews? Oh, no, we're not going to compromise your integrity. Yeah. We're just saying, don't review television anymore. Right, right. I said, why are you whispering? Well, don't tell the story to the newspapers either, please. I yeah. said, oh, okay. Now I can tell them because I don't care anymore. <laughs> See, yeah. Wow. You're well, the first to know that. That's, that's, this that's, is a scoop. I appreciate it. <laughs> that was CBS. That was... Uh, I'll even tell you what it was. It was Bill Ames, the uh, news director, and um, some high muckety muck. Leslie Moonves. Oh, really? Was CBS guy, yeah. He's, he's now the head of yeah. everything, but in yeah. those days he was yeah. down with the wow. O&O division. Wow. And he, he was saying, the advertisers, the advertising department is, is killing me. They're asking me, why do we have this yeah, guy on the air can't do that. telling people not to watch the show yeah. where we're selling advertising in? And this is crazy. Right. <laughs> So, David, uh, you have the YouTube special, and you've got, uh, and the winner is, and you're going back. And the, win and the winners are. And the winners are. Plural. Right. 40 stars, 50 years, 90 minutes. It's quite quite an accomplishment, and a career accomplishment, and uh, it's, I, I just want to, as a fan, I just want to thank you for everything you've done over oh, the years. Oh, that's nice to hear. Appreciate, Appreciate it. Fan. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing many more. Okay, you got it. All right. Thank you so much, David Sheehan. Thank you.